this point. Okay. Um, well, let me first start out by welcoming those of you who are uh, um, listening in at this point uh, to our first uh, seminar in what is uh, Society for Marine Mammalogy seminar series called the Editor's Select um, Series. So it's the Editor's Select Series because in fact, the uh, oh, let me first back up and introduce myself so you know who I am. So I am in fact the society's editor in chief of its journal, Marine Mammal Science. Many of you will know about the journal and many of you may even have been publishing in the journal. Um, so this seminar series um, was suggested to us by our president, Charles Littman, um, and suggested that we use our board of editors for Marine Mammal Science to um, examine what has been published and um, provide uh, um, suggestions on which papers we might which uh, might like to highlight. So what I do is um, ask our editors um, when I, uh, we know we're ready for a, a seminar to uh, provide me with a list of um, up to three potential um, papers from the journal that could serve as the basis for a seminar and to give them to me in rank order of their choice and to give me briefly why they think this is a good paper. And, and let me tell you that I know it's a very difficult task for our uh, associate editors because Marine Mammal Science publishes many, many good papers. Indeed, papers wouldn't be in Marine Mammal Science if they weren't a good paper. So for our first speaker to have become the first speaker, it must have been an outstanding paper that we're going to hear about tonight. Tonight, for us on the East Coast, perhaps for some of you, it's only this afternoon. Um, hopefully, well, we wouldn't mind it at all if some of you are um, in the middle of the morning tomorrow even uh, listening to us. Um, the Society for Marine Mammalogy's Board of Governors ha has talked about ways in which we could increase our communication to a, a broad public um, and to uh, highlight the research done by marine mammal scientists. Um, it, it's already started a series of podcasts, which um, uh, Dr. Chris Parsons um, has taken on as a task. And we know for a fact that those podcasts are receiving glowing um, reviews. Um, so we hope that this new effort um, of these seminars, which will occur um, uh, once a month, um, will likewise get glowing reviews. So um, we will be looking forward to any kind of feedback you choose to give us, but especially to that, uh, what I expect will be some really positive feedback. So um, let me turn then to our first seminar speaker. Um, tonight, we will hear from uh, Ms. Elizabeth Murdoch Titcombe. Um, Elizabeth has been studying bottlenose dolphins in the Indian River Lagoon of Florida for over 20 years. Her research has focused on epidermal diseases and other skin disorders in uh, this population of dolphins. But she's also done extensive social network analysis um, of this population and has used that to, in, um, to apply to various epidemiological studies. Elizabeth was at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution at Florida Atlantic University um, during the time she did her work uh, this, that she will talk about tonight. Um, but she has since moved on and is a senior research biologist with Dolphin Census, um, also in Georgia. Elizabeth uh, has some sideline interests, including uh, being a freelance medical illustrator. I'd be interested in seeing some of her illustrations. Um, I don't know if we'll see any in the talk tonight, but she might let us know if we do. Um, and she, um, she uses her range of scientific studies to support her understanding of complex medical topics. 
So um, Elizabeth is the lead author on her paper, and um, her, her paper was published in the July issue of Marine Mammal Science. Um, her paper is entitled Linear Skin Markings in Common Bottlenose Dolphins, Terciop Truncatus, from the Indian River Lagoon, Florida. She has several co-authors. I will briefly um, tell you who those are. It's Jesse Stevens, who is also with Harbor Branch Institute, Ann Sleeman with Harbor Branch, Brandy Nelson with Harbor Branch, Luke, I may get this wrong, but uh, Luke Rastaraz. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, you might have to do that one for me. <laughs> I'm not sure I would get it right either. <laughs> I see. Okay. Well, Luke, I'm He's sorry if I got me. it really bad. Okay. Adam Schaefer, who is also with Harbor Branch. The late Dr. Gregory Bossert, who is at Georgia Aquarium. John Reef who is with the Department of Environmental and Radiological Health Sciences at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, and Marilyn Mazoyle, who is also with Dolphin Census and affiliated with Harbor Branch. So um, I would actually like to take just a moment to pay tribute to the late Dr. Greg Bossert. Um, I know this was something that was very difficult for Elizabeth. We had some communications about this um, at the time uh, the paper was under review. Um, Dr. Bossert was the senior vice president and chief veterinarian at Georgia Aquarium in Atlanta, um, where for over 30 years um, he, he um, served as a marine mammal clinical uh, um, served in doing marine mammal clinical medicine, as well as marine mammal research, marine bird research, and other wildlife, and published over 130 publications. I think with that, I might just ask you, Elizabeth, if there's anything you'd like to say about uh, your colleague, uh, for your late colleague, Dr. Bossert. Thank you, Daryl. Um, no, I, I want to thank all of my co-authors, but particularly Greg. I mean, he he was there when I started my career 20 years ago. He was just a wonderful mentor and friend and just an amazing man. And he was such a passionate scientist, just brilliant in the field of green mammals and birds and, and beyond. And he was just, he's very missed. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna just quickly back up here. I, I already, uh, goofed up in that I was supposed to let everybody know at the beginning here that we have a limited um, a limit of 100 people uh, and we have now exceeded that limit we're at 102 um, and uh, this is also being live streamed on Facebook so if you know of people who are trying to get in and are not able to because we have gone over our limit on zoom um, uh, you can go to Facebook. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that connection is, but my understanding is that if you're trying to get in, you're probably seeing what connection you need to go to on Facebook. It's, if, they, if they go to Marine Mammalogy on Facebook, which is the Society's Facebook page, then it's live streaming there. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm a little bit of um, a novice at, I don't use Facebook, so. Sorry about that. No, no. <laughs> um, you, can, you can tell a little bit of a, an age difference here, I think, probably. Um, not, not much. <laughs> OK, thank you for that. So um, I also need to tell you that uh, the presentation is being recorded, um, as will be our interactions. So I should be a good boy and not mess up too much here. Um, <laughs> Uh, however, attendees are not in any way being recorded, so you don't have to worry about that for any of you who might be in your pajamas um, listening in or watching. Um, notice I got dressed up for the seminar today. Haven't done that in a long time. Um, so I think with that, uh, we're ready to turn over uh, um, the time to Elizabeth to give us her presentation on 
uh, and it's a question. Tiger stripes on estuarine dolphins, really? Okay, Elizabeth, go ahead. Thank you, Daryl. Yeah, I know this is probably the, uh, the third time I've put on makeup since March or so. So <laughs> it's a, it is just an honor. Thank you so much, Daryl, for all your kind words. And it's, it's absolutely an honor to have been chosen for the editor series for the Society for Marine Mammalogy. I, I'm, I'm very honored to be the guinea pig for tonight to do our first virtual talk here. And I, I hope it all goes well. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I'm, I'm just thrilled that with how many people signed up and are, are getting on and, um, and hopefully we'll view it in the future. So thank you very much. Um, thank you again to all my co-authors. I obviously could not have done this without them. Um, and so the, the title, I just wanted to explain the title. So my, my, um, my paper is called Linear Skin Markings, which was the more, more scientific way for us to term what we've been seeing in our, in our dolphins in the Indian River. But uh, throughout the study, my team and I called them tiger stripes. And you'll, you'll see why later, but hence my, uh, my fun little not quite medical illustration graphic on the front there. <laughs> Oh, all right, I'm already having trouble getting my slides here. Okay, all right. So um, I wanna give you guys a brief background of the basis for our study, and then I'll go into uh, to the details. So for decades, researchers have used photography to, styled wild, to study wild dolphin populations. Uh, using photographs such as the one seen here, researchers have documented numerous epidermal conditions in wild dolphins, um, ranging from pox, which are many of the uh, images that you're seeing on the left side here, all different forms of pox. Um, another so, disease- uh, Elizabeth, oh. could, could I interrupt a second? Sure, I am absolutely. not seeing your screen, so I wonder if oh. others are. Let me see. Yeah, no PowerPoint screen is showing. So yeah, we're gonna have to back up. All right, sorry about that guys. Oh, it stopped sharing it for some reason. Sorry about that. Now, can you see it? There we go, now we've got it. Just the, just the slide and not my notes, right? No notes, just your slide. Okay, let me see here. For some reason it went out of um, presenter view for me. Let me just, sorry guys. See, this is why I'm the guinea pig. <laughs> Nothing ever goes off with some small, without some small glitch. We thought we had it all done right, right? Okay, all right, well, let me see if it'll at least advance it. Yep, okay, so you can see the slide with the skin diseases? Yep. Okay, let's start over. So, <laughs> so um, as I was saying, um, there's been numerous studies around the world that have photographed uh, different epidermal diseases in dolphins. Uh, we have some examples here. Pox on the left side is one that's very popular, seen around the world, attributed to, to uh, various causes seen in dolphin populations. But um, many studies have used photography to track um, and document all different types of pox, um, which are also known as uh, tattoo skin disease. Uh, on the left, some on the left, there's, I'm sorry, on the right side, there's some pox, um, some other skin markings like rake marks, um, and perhaps I see a little lobomycosis in there, which is another disease that, um, that myself in particular has tracked through population using photography, um, along with a multitude of other skin diseases and conditions that have been, um, have been recorded using photographs. So, oh gosh, I don't know why it's not advancing. All right, sorry guys, another, <laughs> it's advancing on my, my slides. Hmm. All right, I apologize for the- All right. Hmm. We're doing everything the way we did it before, and it's not doing it the right way hmm. here. Let's close PowerPoint. Bear with us while we uh, <laughs> resolve this technical challenge. All right, are you seeing it now? Yep. 
We got it All now. Right. There you PowerPoint go. was against me. I think I've gotten it under control now. Okay. You see the slide that says intraspecific or agonistic wounds? Yes. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> um, right. So as, um, as well as different dermal diseases, photography has been used to document um, wounds in bottlenose dolphins and other cetaceans around the world. So on the left, you can see some rake marks. So rake marks are classic intraspecific wounds that are inflicted from one dolphin to another when they're um, biting each other's fins. And you can see all those, um, the parallel markings along the fin there are from a dolphin's teeth. They grab onto each other's fins and pull away. And that's what those, those um, markings on the left are from. Uh, we also have agonistic interactions from uh, animals such as predators like sharks. So all the images that are on the right are different uh, examples of shark wounds, which can range from a, um, a rake mark, sort of like the one you see in the bottom right, where a shark will bite down on top of a dolphin and it will scrape its teeth up, um, up the body without really getting a good, uh, a good bite out of it. And sometimes they unfortunately do get a bite. You can see the lower, the lower left image, um, they might actually get a little part of the fin there. So, um, so again, images like these just show examples of photography being used in populations to be able to record various uh, wounding patterns. Other markings that you see in wild dolphins are unfortunately of anthropogenic origins, so, um, so human inflicted wounds. We see a lot in the Indian River, um, unfortunately, of fisheries interactions. So people discard their, their fishing line and it ends up in the water and it can either get wrapped around a dolphin's dorsal fin or its flukes. Um, usually it does not appear to come off very easily. These often require interventions. I, um, by NOAA to go and catch the animal and remove the line um, from its fins. Unfortunately, sometimes it's animals that enjoy uh, chasing fishing boats. And we have actually had one animal that I believe got caught three times in fishing line, um, just wrapping it around his dorsal. We, we um, sort of funnily named him Lucky because <laughs> he just continued over and over to get caught in fishing line. Um, other than fisheries, we of course have boat interactions, unfortunately. So our poor manatees down in Florida get uh, hit with the props of the boat, the propellers, uh, very often. This one got pretty lucky. It has some scarring, but other than that, it, it seems to be all right. So those are um, a propeller mark going down the, uh, down the body of the manatee. And we can also see, um, we also have evidence of blunt force trauma. If a boat hits a dolphin, um, we have, we've had fins that are, are bent over in half um, from being hit by the hull of a boat. So, um, so various ways, unfortunately, that humans can inflict uh, harm on our, on our wild dolphins here. So uh, we're fortunate enough to, to have our, our cameras out there all the time and to be able to track some of these um, some of these skin disorders that we're seeing. So uh, one thing we tracked, I actually have a couple of papers on lobomycosis, which is a fungal disease that's found only in dolphins and humans. And we actually found it to be endemic in the Indian River Lagoon population. So um, using our photographs, we're able to track the disease through an individual. So the, the images on the left are um, one of our dolphins called Little Slice. And you can see starting with the year 2000 in the upper left corner, um, to the right and then back down to the left uh, through the years, how the disease kind of blossomed on its body and we're able to, to track the progression um, through photographs as well as, um, as other wounds such as the shark bite animals. So um, this was a young calf that got its fin bit, um, bit by a shark. It fortunately healed. You can see the, the back little part kind of fell off and, <laughs> and he healed up nicely. So, so um, with other animals that have uh, more kind of unfortunately mortal wounds were able to track them and, and sort of track um, the healing process and determine potential survivability depending on the, the severity of the wound as well. So I'll give you a little bit of background on the Indian River Lagoon. It is one of the most biodiverse estuaries in North America and it actually spans um, the temperate and tropical climate zones. So this gives the lagoon a unique variety of both species and habitats because of its long, um, narrow and linear uh, formation there. It actually covers um, almost 40% of Florida's east coast. 
And the map here shows you um, the Indian River is actually divided up into six segments using hydrodynamic and geographic features. And I'll show you later on, we use these segments to, um, to assign home ranges to the dolphins in the study. So um, the dolphin study in the, Indian River, in the Indian River has been going on for over 20 years. We have over 2,600 um, individually identified dolphins and we believe the resident population to be over a thousand animals. We have over 420 breeding females and um, over 700 calves with uh, four generations, at minimum four generations that we've tracked through the years. Uh, one very unique uh, uh, facet to this uh, study was actually started by Dr. Bossert back in 2003, and it was annual health assessments that we started doing, and we did them um, for eight separate years. We would actually go out and catch animals in the population that were either random animals that, um, that fit our um, fit the criteria for animals that we could catch or specific targets that we were uh, trying to catch based on different blood titers they'd had in past years or um, different things that we had seen that we had you know, witnessed during our photo ID, um, during our photo ID surveys, uh, perhaps a new disease that we saw that we wanted to, to uh, sample uh, various, for various reasons. So we were very lucky to have these annual health assessments that just gave us an, a myriad of data on our population. So um, in 20 years of looking at dolphins, you start to see some different things. <laughs> so we started noticing these lines on the, um, that were in the skin on the sides of these dolphins. And we affectionately turned them tiger stripes because they were these kind of vertical linear stripes that were on the animals. And we had no idea what they were. We sort of started to Google it. We asked other colleagues if anyone had seen this before and nobody really had. So we figured it was uh, interesting enough to look into. Um, we thought, you know, let's make sure we're not just seeing things. We should try to rule out a couple, you know, some things that it might be. So um, dolphins, uh, depending on how familiar you are with dolphins here, um, when they're born, they actually have what's called fetal folds. So the dolphin, the, the little baby on the left there, you can see the light, um, the light colored lines that are on its body. So when a, um, when a dolphin is in utero, it's actually folded almost in half. And those lines are the result of the animal being born, opening up, <laughs> and they're, they're from the wrinkles basically of the, um, from the animal being, being in utero and folded in half. So um, usually a newborn would have those, um, the fetal folds for a week to a month. Um, but again, it's only, only seen in newborn dolphins. So we were able to rule, to rule that out. Um, in the middle, you can see these lines going down the side of the dolphin, but those are actually just watermarks. So of course, you know, the dolphins are aquatic and they come up from the water and the water can run down their skin in these little rivulets, but um, we were able to, to rule that out using our criteria, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the last photo um, is actually a dolphin that has propeller scars. So initially we thought he might be part of our study because these, these scars were so well-defined on him, um, but eventually going through our criteria, we realized that was just a prop, um, a prop mark on, on this poor guy, but he survived and, and he's, he's doing well. So we were able to rule out um, the propeller marks as well as, as being a cause for these tiger stripes. So we developed a case definition. So, um, so when we were going through all the photos, we had a, a definite, um, uh, set of criteria of what made up these, these tiger stripes, these linear skin markings. And we went back through um, just thousands and thousands of photos to try to, um, to develop a, a picture of what animals um, in the lagoon have this kind of skin affliction and um, the history of them and, and uh, the progression of this, of this condition through certain animals. So um, they are parallel lines that are running down the length of the body. We, we usually saw them go from about the neck to, um, to kind of mid tail stock um, and they were always parallel lines. And we did find that they were most always bilaterally symmetrical. So they were on both sides of the body, um, the same, same um, direction of line, the same width of line, uh, the same look on both sides of the body. The span of the lines or the distance between the lines was about one to eight centimeters. Um, again, we were so fortunate to have these annual health assessments we did. So you can see the picture on the top there. Um, we were able to have uh, body photos of many of the animals that we, that we took uh, samples of. So we have our lovely tape measure and, and we're able to determine 
um, approximate widths of the, um, of the spans of, between the lines from that. Um, the width of the actual lines that we saw is usually about less than one centimeter. And we estimated the depth of them. They were always indented. They were never raised, always indented lines um, to be about one to three millimeters deep. Uh, for the study, we wanted to look at uh, the prevalence of the condition in the IRL dolphin population, how many animals had it, um, compared to, to uh, the ones that didn't, obviously, <laughs> looking at distinct animals uh, in the population. We wanted to look at the age and sex distribution throughout the population, what um, did only older animals get it, younger animals, and male versus female, who, um, who were we seeing this condition in the most. Uh, we wanted to look at the spatial distribution. So using our home ranges, we were able to map, um, map out the animals that had the condition and see if there was any kind of trend that way, um, as well as looking at temporal patterns through the years. So was, was there a boom in one year of this condition and, and less in another year? Um, we wanted to look at the duration of the condition. So how long did it actually last on an animal? How long did they have these, these tiger stripes for? And hypothesize about the etiology or the cause of these skin markings. So here's where it gets interesting. So <laughs> we found that 7% of our distinct individuals, 7% of the population um, had evidence of these linear skin markings, these tiger stripes. Out of those, 92% did have them bilaterally. So we were able to prove that it, it was on both sides of the animal. The 8% that um, did not have a bilateral um, that we could not prove had uh, the bilateral symmet symmetry of these um, of the lines. We just didn't have photos for them. So when you're in the wild, you're you're getting whatever photos you can. So um, that eight percent, we we only had either a left side or a right side um, every time we saw the animals. So we weren't able to to prove definitively that they also had it um, on their on the opposite side. But we assume that they that they do. Eighty-five percent of the animals that had this were female, which really stood out to us. We thought that was super interesting and really wanted to delve further into that. That was very surprising. Out of the 85% um, that were females, 100% of those had calves. So every female that was seen with this condition had given birth to a calf at some point. Um, another really interesting <laughs> fact was that 16% of those females actually had a calf that developed the condition as well. So that led us to wonder if there was a genetic component to these skin markings. Um, next, we looked at age. So the age when first observed with the with this um, condition was actually one. We had a, a calf that was only one year old that we saw with these tiger stripes up to the age of 20. We had a, a dolphin that was as old as 20 that, that showed these markings. Um, when we looked at the age of onset, so to determine the ages of onset, we, we threw out, we had to throw out the calf that was a year old because the calf was first seen with the linear skin markings. So we were not able to have him in the age of onset because we had never seen him without, without the markings. So we used only animals that we could see, that we had, had a history of that we saw before, um, before they had the, the tiger stripes and after. So from that, we were able to determine the age of onset was um, three years to 17 years. So one animal that, um, that got these tiger stripes was as young as three. One animal did not get it until they were 17 years old. Um, the annual prevalence we found um, was the highest in 2013, which I'll talk about a little later why, why that's um, significant. Uh, our study period did go from 2002 up to 2015. And um, the mean prevalence, the mean annual prevalence was 7.9% throughout this study. So this was another really striking finding. We, as I told you, we were, um, we assigned individuals to one of the six segments that the Indian River is divided up into. And we did that using um, the, the segment that the animal spent most of its time in. It was assigned that segment as their home range segment. And from that, we did kernel analyses um, using all the home ranges of the, the positive individuals. Um, obviously, you can see overwhelming, an overwhelming number of cases were found in the north and central lagoon. 98.8% were found um, in the northern half of the lagoon. Uh, only one case, so Sebastian Inlet is the inlet that's in the, um, right in the middle there, right where the uh, red sort of stops. 
in the map. Um, only one case was found south of Sebastian Inlet, and it was actually all the way down in um, in segment four. It wasn't even in segment three. So we just sort of had this, this strange outlier, one case down south, all of the others were in the north and central parts of the lagoon. Um, for duration, the, uh, the longest duration that we had was an animal that had it for 15 years. And, um, and that animal is still alive. There were several animals that were actually still alive beyond 2015, beyond the study period that continued to have the condition. Um, and once acquired, it appeared to just persist on the animal indefinitely. We, we did not have any animals where the, the markings receded in any way. Once they had it, they had it. So what could possibly be causing this? This was, this was our just question of the, <laughs> of the year. We had no idea what was making these markings. So we just poured through manuscripts over and over, um, Googled every permutation of linear skin marking <laughs> that we could possibly find um, and just came up with nothing. We, we had, no one had ever seen it before. There was nothing in the white papers or even the internet really about about these kind of linear scars that we were seeing um just just no idea the one thing we found that was sort of probably not even similar but the closest thing we found was um was by Sanino et al um in 2014 they published a paper um this is actually a chilean dolphin and it had this this the skin markings that were reticulated um which you can see that the a arrow is pointing to so very strange markings, sort of linear, but more connected shapes and not raised, um, totally flush with the skin, not raised or indented. Um, so not even really close, but the closest thing we, that we could find at all in the, in the papers. So again, what, what could this be? We, we figured if, if we're, we're writing about this, we're going to have to rule out every possible thing. I mean, this was my advisors, um, you know, we, we realized this is going to be, you know, this is going to be a, a peer reviewed manuscript. It has to be really solid. And, and a lot of people, frankly, did not think that, that it was going to be published because we didn't know what it was. <laughs> so another reason why I'm just thrilled that, that SMM chose this as, um, as one of their editor series, because I, I got a lot of pushback trying to, to get this paper published just because usually you're writing about things that, are known about and you have lots of references and you know lots of other papers to to you know go on the back of and this this was just no one knew <laughs> no one knew at all what it was so so again we had to kind of go through and and rule out everything possible and then sort of come up with our own ideas so um, first thing was skin disease so this is one of our dolphins that has um, a bad case of tattoo skin disease or pox here and um, Nothing in the literature, you know, remind us, reminded us at all of, of pox or really any other skin disease, as I mentioned before, just that, just that one on that Chilean dolphin in the last slide. So we, we were able to rule out any kind of, of, of epidermal disease. Um, the next thing we looked at, again, was rake marks. So could it have come from another animal somehow? Um, could an animal be making these, these marks on the dolphin? So most of the rake marks I showed you before, um, the intraspecific rake marks from other dolphins are usually, um, they can be sometimes coming anteriorly, but usually they're on, on an appendage. So a fluke, a pec fin, um, a, um, a dorsal fin, a place that's easy for another dolphin's mouth to grab and scrape. Um, this one in the middle, I believe, looks to me like it, it's probably from a shark. So a shark could make big rake marks from the, if you remember the pictures that we saw in the beginning, there are big sharks out there <laughs> and they can, you know, grab right over the, the uh, dorsal fin of a dolphin. However, our markings did not match up with that. So, um, so shark marks have, or shark bites rather, always have an arced, um, an arc shape to them because of the, the way that the shark's mouth is shaped. Um, there's always an arc and it would be really difficult. Usually sharks are attacking from the top or the bottom, but to have them be so perfectly symmetrical, to have a shark that was that large that could get the whole dolphin in its mouth and scrape down <laughs> just seemed very, very unlikely. So, so we ruled out 
um, the fact that they were just some sort of rake marks. Um, the other thing is they didn't disappear. So usually if you have, um, you have some sort of, of sort of superficial wound, as you can see um, the, the shark wounds or a, um, or a tooth break, they end up healing over time. And as I mentioned, these did not heal. They did not resolve in any way. They just stayed on the animal. So we ruled out um, any kind of rake marks. So propellers. So um, several people that I spoke to just insisted they had to be propellers. It had to be some sort of man-made you know, thing that was hurting these dolphins, a, a propeller. Uh, they, the marks certainly look like, at a quick glance, if they, if they were a little wider, that they could be prop marks. So they are um, they are parallel, they're going down the body. Um, definitely prop marks are probably the most similar thing to, uh, to what we were seeing. However, um, we did extensive research on the way that propellers mark dolphins and particularly manatees. So we read a lot of manatee papers um, and there has been extensive studies on how different motors, um, whether it's the speed of the motor, the size of the propeller, um, all these different factors that go into how the motor marks up an animal <laughs> when it gets hit with a with the propeller. So um, none of the none of these um, prop wounds, um, even as much as they varied through the different size motors, the speed of the boat, all these all these different factors, none of them matched up with our lines. So the the propeller wounds were always much further apart um, than our lines, which were you know one to eight centimeters. Prop, uh, the prop marks, I think, the smallest distance was five centimeters, but usually I think it was an average of, of 10 to 12 centimeters apart. Um, the prop wounds were much deeper. So um, as you can imagine, if you're getting hit with a prop, <laughs> it's, it's going into the skin and, um, and much deeper. And the actual wounds were, were significantly wider than the lines that we were seeing as well. Um, the biggest uh, no for the prop marks is the bilateral symmetry. So it'd be very difficult to imagine a dolphin going up to a boat, getting hit by the prop, coming down, and either the same time or a different time going up on the other side and getting hit by a prop. <laughs> that seems, seems highly, highly unlikely. So we, we ruled out uh, the, the chance that these could be from propellers. So then we thought, well, maybe it's something man-made. Is there something under the water that could be that maybe the dolphin could be rubbing up against, you know, scratching itself like a like a cat on a post, um, you know, something under the water that we're not seeing that they were rubbing up against that were causing these these scarring patterns. So we we did some research into that. Do dolphins even do that? You know, <laughs> um, what could be under the water? And uh, nothing nothing that we found really matched up with with our line. So the biggest factor would be if an animal is rubbing up against something say under the water, out of the water, it's it's not going to be perfectly rubbing in the same direction every time. The the lines from whatever it's scratching on are going to be crisscrossed. Just just the nature of, of how the animal would move, even a very slight, slight curve in their body or a slight twitch would cause a line to crisscross and not be completely parallel down their body. So we ruled out any kind of man-made um, man apparatus under the water that they were, that they were rubbing up against. Um, the other really interesting thing is we never saw this skin condition as a fresh wound. So as you saw before, they are these, you know, not, not deep, but not completely superficial lines going up and down um, the animal's body. And we never saw them as fresh, they were never they were never um, bleeding. They were never white. So I I put this picture up here so you could see um, those are fresh rake marks on the um, on the dorsal edge uh, of the dorsal fin there, and the, sorry the leading edge of the dorsal, and they are white when they get scraped. And we never saw them white. We we never saw them in any sort of healing process. They were just there. <laughs> so we ruled out the fact that it would be any kind of of um, rake mark like that. And, and that was just another interesting factor that we never saw them as a, as a fresh wound. So my whole research team was women. And when we first started seeing these, I mean, uh, so long ago, one of us said, gosh, they really look like stretch marks. <laughs> and um, no offense to my male colleagues, but they all scoffed. 
there's no way they're stretch marks. Those aren't stretch marks. No one, you know, they, <laughs> that's not what they are. Um, so I secretly started researching stretch marks and learned a lot about them, probably more than, than you want to know. But, um, but I started looking at, at human stretch marks and trying to see if stretch marks had ever been published on um, in mammals. So as we all know, most mammals have fur. So it's very difficult to see any kind of stretch mark um, on, on a mammal. And there is nothing published um, really on cetaceans and the stretch marks. I was able to find one paper that mentioned stretch marks. Um, it was a fairly recent paper in the, in the last decade that mentioned stretch marks on a pregnant um, dolphin. but it, it had one picture, the stretch marks were actually um, more up towards the neck and upper torso. They weren't really around the belly area and they didn't reference at stretch marks in, in, in um, I mean, they didn't have a reference you know, as to why they were stretch marks. They just called these, these markings on the animal stretch marks. And that was literally the only mention that, that I could find of stretch marks in a cetacean or a dolphin. So, um, so again, I was looking at, at um, lots of human stretch marks and um, we, uh, you know, obviously they occur with rapid weight gain or pregnancy and um, they, you know, stretch marks are due to rapid growth in skin, um, having to stretch, you know, quickly over, um, over a larger area in a small amount of time and they can be raised or indented. So, so there were some differences in what we were seeing, but they, they just sort of looked close. Um, one exception to, uh, sorry, to them not being reported in mammals is actually um, in cows. So, so leather is made from cows and many leather hides uh, show evidence of stretch marks in, uh, from the cows. And again, that was, that was probably the only thing I found and not in a, in a white paper by any means, that was just internet research on uh, stretch marks in mammals. So again, I went, went back to the humans. So, um, so human stretch marks, this was another really interesting thing that we found, um, they're actually uh, genetic. So the human stretch marks either in pregnancy, which is um, their uh, striae gravidarum is the name of stretch marks that occur in pregnancy, or striae distense, which are regular stretch marks from, from weight gain, um, they have a genetic component in humans. So if you remember, uh, we did have 16% of our calves uh, that that where their mothers also uh, showed the condition. So we thought that, that that was really interesting. That was just one hypothesis we had that it could potentially be, be some sort of stretch, stretch mark in, um, that we were seeing in these dolphins. Um, again, we were just sort of you know, racking our brains. What, what could be causing the skin condition? And I can't wait to hear from you guys when we do the Q&A to try to, to uh, get some ideas of what it might be. And, and I'm really excited to see if any of you um, that study dolphins have ever seen this before as well. So um, the IRL has had um, at least three unusual mortality events. So um, that is a, um, a large die off of dolphins uh, in, uh, condensed into a short period of time. So um, one of the UMEs actually occurred in 2013, which was the height um, of the annual prevalence that we found. Um, and the, uh, the only significant gross finding from actually all of the UMEs was emaciation. The animals that were uh, dying in these UMEs were all emaciated. So we wondered if that might have some kind of component, but we really didn't have any specific evidence that could link the tiger stripes with the UMEs, but it was just because the other years um, weren't necessarily higher. It was just that 2013 year happened to be um, also a UME year. So we didn't know if that might have some sort of effect on it. Um, we keep wondering if these uh, tiger stripes are linked to weight gain and loss, and that would obviously be affected by prey availability. So um, because the spatial distribution of affected animals um, was so strongly uh, weighted towards the North and Central Lagoon uh, that that may actually reflect spatial variations in prey quality and quantity just in the, the differing lagoon habitats. So the Northern IRL, which had, if you remember the most affected animals, um, it only has one inlet. So that can lead to major issues with seagrass availability, 
which is the food for many of the prey species of the dolphins. So seagrass can definitely be a limiting factor for different prey species. Um, and also algal super blooms have really been known to occur in the northern regions, and those can just decimate seagrass populations. So this could all have an effect on prey availability for the dolphins and in turn cause them to have um, weight loss followed by weight gain uh, during some years. So obviously another big question was the males or females versus males. So why, why was there such a skew towards the females and the population? So we do know that females ex uh, experience greater nutritional stress during pregnancy. So we didn't know if that somehow was affecting the skin. Um, and what's interesting is IRL dolphin prey studies have indicated that males and females might be choosing different prey species to eat. So further studies would need to be done to figure out if, like, how closely um, how closely those could be related, and they would need to look at, at prey and habitat preferences within the dolphins, males and females, um, and also divide that up into the northern and southern areas of the lagoon and see if that has any has any bearing on um, on the males versus females and their their um, their prey preferences. Another issue is water quality and salinity. So we didn't know if this was possibly having an effect on their skin and somehow causing these, these interesting markings. Um, water quality and salinity have definitely been known to affect epidermal lesions in cetaceans. And in areas where there is poor water quality and low salinity, um, there's definitely a heightened um, occurrence of epidermal lesions in those areas. In particular, uh, low salinity has been associated with lesions that can cause skin degeneration, um, but that's not really consistent with these markings that we're seeing. It's, it's just a possible factor. Maybe, maybe the water quality and salinity was somehow altering our dolphin skin or not altering it, affecting our dolphin skin and making it um, somehow make these, these sort of scarred patterns on, on the animals. We, we have no idea. So obviously further studies um, looking at environmental factors, habitat preferences within the animals would be, um, would be a, a great start to trying to, to de decipher what this is, um, as well as getting lesion biopsies. So unfortunately, during all of our health assessments, we weren't able to actually get a skin biopsy specifically of the lesion, the, of the linear skin markings. So that would be really interesting to sort of look at the the skin makeup um, of the actual scar to see uh, if anything, if there's any, any hints hidden in there. So I just wanna thank again, um, the Society for Marine Mammalogy so much for having me to do this presentation. Um, again, I wanna thank my co-authors and um, my funding source, which is the Protect Wild Dolphins license plate. So thank you to everyone. And um, if anyone, again, has any theories or questions, I, I can't wait to, to chat with you all. So thank you so much for coming.